What Did You Expect by Nancy Stroer. The rooster's nose was his most salient feature, curved and sharp as he strutted and preened in front of formation. It was an act, but the rooster snapped his barnyard into a submission without apology. He told me, ma'am, I need you to take all the females to the clinic. There'd been a rash of pregnancies in the barracks. Okay, maybe two in as many months, but this was the rooster nipping his birds into line. It's like we're running a goddamn brothel on the female floor, he said, after he'd dismissed the soldiers. Other company leaders remarked variously, these females got to learn to keep their legs closed. Put males and females together and what did you expect? What did I expect? I'd expected to learn to get along as a woman in a man's world. I knew how things worked and expected I'd do fine with that, having grown up with three brothers, playing sports, all occurring in the broader context of a world run by men. I didn't think about any of this in so many words back then. I didn't know that I was a guy's girl, a term my daughters use now, with a derisive curl in the corners of their mouths. Back in the olden days of don't ask, don't tell, unless it's super juicy, the NCOs were ranting the same old litany to a sexual but sex-free God, repeated in NCO meetings and formations and ad hoc conversations by the filing cabinets. Sex was a given, a right for some, and a loaded weapon for others. Male soldiers wanted to have sex, were going to have sex. The women had to expect to receive that attention, whether they wanted it or not. And they should expect it, but not want it. If they wanted it, they must appear not to, otherwise they'd get a reputation as the barracks bicycle. Those were the expectations. No one expected birth control talks for the male soldiers. Two women were pregnant, but two of the guys were walking around looking kind of sheepish at times, kind of proud at others. There was much slapping of shoulders and good-natured cussing, but no admonitions for them. I processed information differently in my early 20s and didn't have anyone to talk to in any case. I was so young, still surfacing from the dream world of adolescence to find myself drowning in the patriarchy, except I thought I was swimming just fine. Sure, the commander was a woman, but she was an androgynous little elf, and we left her alone because to engage her in conversation was to invite a deluge of unwanted information about her irritable bowel syndrome. The only other female officer was pregnant herself, but married, and therefore did not count on the tally of concern. She spent a little more time getting her hair done than doing PT, but she ran the supply warehouse with confidence and competence. She was a black woman with a team of mostly non-white soldiers. Her operation was a bit intimidating to me, and maybe secretly to the rooster too, because his beak was out of her business. There was righteous sex, guys going to the red, red light district, and sex that was out of control, women daring to have sex in their barracks rooms. The NCOs moralized about the need for the guys to get laid and the impact of single women getting pregnant on the mission. Everyone laughed at the idea of the unsexy having sex. I recognized the double and triple standards, but still bought all the tangled lines. Maybe these young female soldiers don't know about birth control, I thought. They couldn't all be the dirtbags the sergeant said they were, just getting pregnant to get out of the barracks and straight to the head of the line for military housing and the priority spots at the Child Development Center. Maybe they were just waking up as humans too. Imagine my surprise then to find the women gathered in the clinic lobby, not looking contrite or curious, but sullen and angry. I didn't quite get their mood. Don't you want to be in charge of when you get pregnant? I asked them. Surely they'd joined up to be all they could be. Capricious childbearing would shoot their career trajectories out of the sky. Standing next to me, Johnson swung her swollen belly around. She was small, and curls framed her brown face. Cute is a diminutive way to describe her, but she was diminutive. She was objectively cute. I didn't know her since she worked in the supply warehouse, where women made up about a quarter of the workforce, in contrast to my operation across the parking lot with the mechanics, where the air was heavy with secondhand smoke, ACDC, the ping of wrenches and scraping of toolboxes across concrete floors. All the women in the company watched each other, though, and my general impression of the ones in the supply warehouse was that they were as quietly competent as the pregnant female officer who ran their show. 
they were organized, and a little disparaging of the men who worked there because they clowned around too much. A bit dismissive of me as too rough and ready. Too accommodating of the rooster and his ilk. Maybe they found the rooster and me too white, and therefore suspect. This insight is a late ad. I'm sure I didn't think much of the racial dynamics at play in those days, but my memories are fully colorized now. So cute little Johnson rounded on me and said, through clenched teeth, I'll have as many children as I goddamn well want. And I had no response. It was such an astounding, revelatory moment. Of course she was right. Of course she was outraged at the rooster's overreach. A woman of any marital status can have as many children as she goddamn well wants. A black woman might justifiably feel more ferocious about this than anyone. Johnson's withering stare, those soft cheeks pulled into a parenthesis of disdain, was an emotional heat round. And in a flash, I melted into a puddle of shame, remembering how my father made me return a pair of cargo pants when I was 15 because they were too revealing. The second pair I bought was so baggy, I had to take them in at the waist, which, in my newly self-conscious opinion, made my butt look even bigger. This was the first time I'd been explicitly told to hide my assets. I stopped wearing the cargo pants, and, among other things, I stopped volunteering to go to the board in math class, no longer wishing to show my work or anything else. Might as well disappear my whole body, starve it into its pre-adolescent shape, or maybe eat and drink to keep up with the boys, or go on whack diets to have something to talk about with the girls, or do all the sports and sweat and swear and carry the mortar plate on rut marches and be considered just another one of the guys. It didn't matter. I wasn't one of them. The male soldiers still vied to run behind me in formation. Let me hitch myself to that ride, they'd say. They left me notes under my car wiper blades and lewd sculptures on my desk. They backed me into corners of quiet offices. They turned up at my house at odd hours. It was easiest to laugh it off, to call them the assholes they were, to put them all in their proper places, and to keep my terror to myself. What did I expect? I had expected army men to misunderstand me. My religious father with his MFA, who had enlisted as a medic in the days of the draft so he could control his fate, told me as much when I was insisting that I'd be able to control my fate too. It's different now, I said, and I'll be an officer. But there are lots of ways to kill a person without firing a single shot. And on my very first day in my very first unit, my very first platoon sergeant took one look at my left hand and said, we got to get you married. An unmarried officer will cause trouble. I hadn't expected a welcome like that at all. And here was Johnson with her soft round cheeks and her rounder belly, unashamed of the truth of the matter, which was that even she, this actual cherub of a woman, had had sex. And now she was having a goddamn baby. And she didn't give a flying fuck what I or the rooster or anyone thought about her marital status or any of her choices. Johnson's comment was a two by four up the side of my head. And it woke me all the way up right there, even though I still didn't know what to do with the information. I startled at the forcefulness with which she asserted her right to make decisions about her body. It's embarrassing to admit now, but it never occurred to me before then that I didn't have to just drift along, accepting and accommodating. I've heard many white veterans say that they got to know and become friends with people of color for the first time when they were in the military. But maybe we were just laughing with them at company picnics and completely missing the subtext. Maybe we all relied on each other in the shit, but not often enough in the quiet times. It was a risk for Johnson to say what she said to me, and a gift, but not so much an overture of friendship as an opening salvo. I can only think that she was so angry she couldn't keep her thoughts to herself, which at the time made me stop caring what the men thought. I hadn't known how much I cared what the men thought. 
and to crave insight into what the black women, the enlisted women, the queer women, all the ones operating outside of the narrowly defined parameters of an acceptable life for a female soldier, which was all of us really, but some more than others, were thinking behind their shuttered mouths. When someone rounds on you with the convulsive truth, it's hard to hear, but it is a gift, and Johnson taught me to grab it with both hands, to expect to be surprised, and in a good way, in a useful way by other women, even when what they are saying is hard to hear.